Good morning. A blessed uh, Sunday of the Transfiguration Day to you, the end of the season of Epiphany, and uh, the beginning soon of the season of Lent on Wednesday, uh, and blessed and happy Valentine's Day to each of you. Our service uh, is printed in the uh, bulletin. At the end of the service, we'll do something that's a I had a tradition when I was in my former parishes, and that's the burial of the Alleluia. Uh, often churches will take an Alleluia banner, fold it, and bury it in the ground, in fact. But we're not doing that today. We're just going to remove our Easter banner, since we don't have an Alleluia banner. Something to think about. We can probably configure that down the road. I invite you to please stand for our call to worship. Gathering in this sacred place, we anticipate new wonders each week. Wherever two or three are gathered to worship, a Holy Spirit is present. Open our eyes to witness the fantastic love and wondrous joy waiting to be revealed, even this day, even in this place. We will go and camp in the sanctuary, but when we leave today, May our hearts be open to all the wonders of God's beautiful world. And we share in our responses for the confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house, uh, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And please join me as we pray together our prayer of the day. Almighty God, that the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts, transfigure us by your beloved Son, and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Second Kings in the second chapter. 
and this is the call of Elisha. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by the whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Eli Elisha, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And so they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and they stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. And then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. And he responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. And as they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha kept watching and cried out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went across. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me as we turn to the 50th Psalm, Psalm 50, and we will share responsively by whole verse, verses 1 through 6. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting, out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the peoples. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the righteousness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. A reading from Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians in the fourth chapter. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers 
to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, <clears throat> such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them. and From the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations upon our hearts, be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We all know that many things in life come as both blessings and curses. Case in point is what I'd like to talk about today is the status of some of us in this room. How many of you are the firstborn sibling in your family? Any firstborns? We got three of us here. Okay. Maybe you can identify in part with this. They always, they, they always thought, for me being the uh, firstborn sibling, that I was always my parents' favorite, and of course I was, and that I was Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, could do no wrong. I did plenty wrong. I would be the first to be able to get things. Of course, I was the first child, and they got the hand-me-downs, but there were other things they got as well. It's a matter of perspective, is it not? On the other hand, I'm probably more aware of the responsibilities that went along with being that uh, firstborn in the family. I always felt that I, there was more expected of me than of the others, especially that I should be a model for the rest, whatever that would look like. I've usually been myself a doer. I may tend to take charge of things, I may feel obligated to step up and be responsible, sometimes even when I don't want to be. I often have a need to please others and don't really like trouble or conflict. I'm more patient in listening to others' ideas. and I don't have to have the last authoritative word, though firstborn status might bear that to be. When I work with my dad, he always had a higher degree of expectation for me, his son, than he did for seasoned workers. And I was just a teenager. It was a heavy burden to bear. Firstborns, we did get a lot of attention initially, until the second one and the third one, and in my case, the fourth one, the fifth one, and sixth one came along. And I was pretty much on my own, because I had a sense of being able to stand on my own and had that discipline 
down for my life. I uh, was often the one that got probably in trouble more than the others because I, I took the blame for a lot of things. There was also a price to be paid for being firstborn. Remember the story of uh, the Passover. It was the firstborn children of the household of the Israelites who would be struck down and killed of all of the firstborn of the land of Egypt unless they were protected in the house that had been marked with the lamb's blood on the doorpost and the lentils. However, the firstborn was the one who was privileged to receive the father's blessing and a double share of the inheritance. But privilege was not the intent of that right of the firstborn. Rather, it was an obligation. Take, for example, in the story of Jacob and Esau. Birth order was not necessarily the firstborn in this situation, because Esau was born before his brother Jacob. Yet it was Jacob who received his father's blessing and who was the more responsible of the two. The firstborn of Israel, it applied to the male children, of course, and it meant that this child would have authority over the others. And before the law of Israel was instituted from Sinai, it was also the situation that these would be the ones eligible to serve in the priesthood. And when the father of the household died, it was the responsibility of the firstborn to step up and take responsibility for the rest of the household until he had a household of his own. Now we know Jesus was the firstborn in his family to Mary and Joseph. Scripture attests he was also firstborn from the dead to the resurrection life. His natural and God-given talents of leadership, they quickly emerged. He assumed greater responsibility, that of saving humanity from the sins of the world. Though we do not know if Peter was the firstborn, he had a lot of the qualities of the firstborn. Peter was a doer, and it wasn't until much later that he learned the patience that would be needed to be a leader of that first century church after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. He, like his father Jonah, was a fisherman. His brother was Andrew, also in the family business. They worked alongside of the family of Zebedee, also fishermen, John and James. So they were familiar with that task, but also with each other. So when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the high mountain apart and where he was transfigured, we see Peter acting in that typical fashion of Peter. Herein lies what I'm suggesting is a lesson to be garnered from the story of the transfiguration. That those of us, like Peter, tend to be action-oriented, need to learn to pray, to read, to listen, to reflect and to meditate before just doing. The future glory of Jesus would, that Jesus would receive when he was resurrected is revealed when they go up to Mount Tabor, or Mount Tabor as some would call it, back up north, the little church of Mount Tabor. And there he hears what his future will behold. This is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. And not that alone, but from God these words that I think are applicable to all of us, and that is, listen to him. Jesus is affirmed as the sovereign authority of God, even over Moses, the great patriarch, and the greatest of the prophets, Elijah. Their conversation. This marks the beginning of a new era in the history of people's relationships with God. It marks the beginning of the era of the messianic coming, confirming that Jesus is indeed the Messiah of God, the Savior of Israel, and the Savior of humanity. And it marks also a new beginning and a new relationship with Jesus and his disciples. 
it. What does Peter do in that moment? He said, Lord, it's good to be here. Let me go and build you three little shacks so we can hang out together. He's got to do something. What is he missing in the moment? When we are surprised, I think, by significant things, sometimes we go into our dumb mode, not really knowing what to do in the situation, compelled to do the common and the ordinary that is our fallback. Peter falls back to doing something. The significance of the three building is, is not really dealt with in the text. That's secondary. Perhaps it was Peter's way of saying, let's keep this wondrous thing going for a little longer. And who doesn't want to savor the spectacular even more? He has yet become the rock that Jesus would build his church upon. The strong, dependable, level-headed man that he would become for the early church. Remember there were a few other impulsive behaviors of Peter. The story where he sees Jesus walking on water and he steps out of the boat and begins to walk on the surface and quickly sinks and Jesus has to save him. Didn't think that went through very well. When in the garden of Gethsemane with Jesus, he takes a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the servants that accompanied those to the garden to take Jesus and arrest him. He quickly denies knowing that Jesus, he has spent any time with him when he waits by the fire outside of Jesus' place of imprisonment. And just prior to this trip, six days earlier, they're at Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asked them the simple question, who do people say that I am? And Peter responses, you are the Christ, the Messiah. And then he quickly turns against Jesus for what Jesus says he is going to do. That the Son of Man must go forth and die and be raised up in three days. And Jesus rebukes him, get behind me, Satan. If only he had reflected and thought and prayed and meditated a little more. I'm not saying that there are not times when one needs to act. There comes a time when we need to be decisive and perhaps even prompt. A time to seize the moment or people's lives may perish. If a firefighter stood around just admiring the fire and seeing, oh, okay, let's think this one through and let's, uh, let's not be too hasty on this. But they don't. They know the circumstances before they enter a building. They take their time getting the proper gear on for safety and protection. They gather their tools and then they rush forth and act. We are thankful for their work. There will be a time when Jesus will have to act. He cannot put off the inevitable that faces him. He alone would have to choose to go to the cross. But before that, he goes to the mountain. He talks with Elijah. He talks with Moses. He prays to God for answers, for words that would propel him down the mountain and toward Jerusalem and the end of his life. Before Jesus' arrest, we find him praying in the garden, encouraging again Peter and James and John who are with them to do the same. But they don't. They fall asleep. Perhaps prayer and meditation might have enlightened them to what was coming down the road for their Lord. They might have dealt with it in a little different way. We all know people who seem to be impulsive in the things that they do, that react solely from the gut or the moment that's called for, that do things that sometimes cannot be undone, that do things that could have used a little bit more thought and perhaps a bit of prayer. Things like being tactful don't just come naturally. And blunt honesty may enable others to know where you stand or you're coming from, but does it have not have a price of hurting and offending as well? There's a really helpful thing 
that God says to them who hear and see the cloud on the mountaintop, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Close your mouth and open your ears. Quit talking and start listening. There are times, I think, when people like Peter, like many of us, need to just slow down and to quiet down before acting. Perhaps then, in times of conflict, cooler heads might prevail. People might not jump to conclusions or assume certain things. The theologian and pastor Eugene Peterson writes, Busyness is the enemy of spirituality. It is filling our time with our own actions instead of paying attention to God's actions. It is taking charge. This kind of hit right on Peter's problem, or sometimes my problem, or perhaps your own. If you're that A-type firstborn personality, we like to be in control, we like to be in charge, but we quickly learn we're not in control of a lot of stuff, but God certainly is. And how else might we discern what our actions and what our choices might be, but that we take that time to reflect, to pray, to meditate, and to talk with God? God who is in charge. He modeled and lived that to the end of his life, Jesus did. Jesus resisted temptations to save himself before Pilate or call upon his heavenly Father to take him from the cross. He trusted what God was doing in his life. But he was in communion with the Father. It's kind of like this. If we will listen, If we will seek to know and do God's will, God offers a blessing. If instead we choose to chart our own course, to take charge instead of seeking God's guidance and help, we may lose that blessing. And here's another choice for us people. Going with God or going in our own way. There's a lot implied in that simple statement. And part of that is faith. We are able to trust and believe that God's will and God's way is right and good. He has told us and shown us that. If we can, we will be more intent in listening, praying, meditating on His words and His ways. When parents bring their children to the church for baptism, They do so through faith, that they must trust God and must that God will accept their child as his own. We believe in our hearts that a relationship with God is good and right. For our children, we commend them to God's care. And in the next few years, we need to do those crucial things for that child that will be on us to model and to teach our children to allow God's ways to be a guiding way and principle for how they will live. Do not our hearts embrace the very things that Jesus has learned, that God would see him through, even more than any of us will ever experience in a lifetime. We entrust our physical lives to our physicians when it comes to matters of life and death, And Christ calls us simply to do the same with the entirety of our life, believing that God's will is right and good. If we truly regard God as the Holy One of our lives, who offers us salvation and hope, why not do the things that are needful to obtain the Father's direction for our life and how we might act? Perhaps it's time to stop and simply smell the roses. Doing so by reflecting and meditating and praying and not rushing into action and into taking charge. Wednesday begins our season of Lent. And here is a wonderful opportunity to certainly be more attentive to prayer, to meditation, to reflection. 
to hearing what God's voice may be saying to us in our personal lives, in our communal lives, one with another. I'm going to give it a try even more intently. I trust and invite you to do the same. Amen. I invite you to uh, turn to hymn number 671. Remain seated. We're just going to add another hymn in today. And it's, a, I think, a nice hymn. Shine, Jesus, shine. Hymn number 671. We begin with the refrain, and the refrain is repeated after each of the two verses. Shine, Jesus, shine. Let fill the land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill the land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever clinging a glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your glory. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and glory. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. We probably should have just stuck with the refrain on that one. <laughs> That's too low for me. My apologies. I invite you to please stand as we turn to our profession of faith and we share the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. <clears throat> he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We long for a world transfigured by the life and love of our God. And therefore we bring him our needs and, our, and the needs of this world as we turn to God in prayer. And let us pray. We pray, O Lord, that the Holy Spirit may continue to guide the church in truth and her light may shine more brightly in this troubled world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that church leaders will be gifted with strong faith and that their words be filled with wisdom to lead many to know Jesus. We pray, O Lord, that you would help each of us to be witnesses to your glory and give heartfelt testimony to the power and the goodness of your word through the words that we share and the lives that we live. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that world leaders may seek the counsel of you, O God, and trust in your ways as they govern their peoples. We pray for our Senate as it has deliberated over matters that have been difficult for our land, and as both House and Senate will deal with difficult issues facing our nation. Give to them and our state governments and local authorities wisdom and insight to do your will in the work that they are elected to do on our behalf. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that faith communities will grow in respect for God's gift of life, especially in those who are most vulnerable, who cannot care for themselves. As the Lenten season commences soon, may we be mindful of the least of these. We are called to serve in the community and in the world of which we are citizens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that the sick and infirmed may have the adequate care needed for life and healing. And so we lift up in prayer this day, Debbie Halstead, a friend of Elaine's, Gordon Kelsey, a friend of Jones. We pray for my friend Lynn and Connie and my sister Gail, for Nikki and Tom, for Evelyn, for Elaine, for JT and Miriam, for Bill, and for others whom we name in our hearts before you now. Restore them, O Lord, and give them hope and health. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray that those who have died may see God's face to face and share in the glory of the transfiguration especially all who have been afflicted by COVID-19, by cancer and other diseases, in accident, in the face of war, pestilence, hunger, and even age. Help us to be a resurrection, hope-filled people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We make preparation for the sharing of our Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who sharing our life lived among us to reveal your glory and love that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light, 
And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. My friends, our Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took some bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup. When he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. Behold, that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All is prepared, come and share in his feast. You may be seated and come forth as we're prepared. Joan, this is the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, given and shed for you. Donna, the blood, the body and blood of Jesus, our Lord, given and shed for you. Mary Ann, the body and blood of Jesus, our Lord, given and shed for you. James, the body and blood of Jesus, our Lord, given and shed for you. Evelyn, this is the body and blood of Jesus, which is given and shed for you. Evelyn, the body and blood of Jesus, given and shed for you. Donna, the body and blood of Jesus, given and shed for you. Deanne, the body and blood of Jesus, given and shed for you. Tim, the body and blood of Jesus, given and shed for you. Friends, the body of Christ given for you, take and eat. And the blood of Christ it's shed for you, take and drink. Please stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. And together we pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you, 
and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, we desist from singing Alleluia, the song chanted by angels, because we have been excluded for a while from the company of the angels on account of Adam's sin. In the Babylon of our earthly life, we sit by the streams, weeping as we remember Zion, or as the children of Israel in an alien land hung their harps upon the willows. So we too must forget the Alleluia song of the season of sadness, of penance, and bitterness of heart. Today we lay to rest the Alleluia with the hope of its resurrection on Easter Sunday. As we bury our dead, or as we enter into the fasting of Lent, we do not silence our tongues because of despair or permanent loss. Rather, we do so with confidence that what has been deposited into the earth, our dead, our Alleluia, will rise again. Yet in this period of preparation, we remain keenly aware of the mystery of sin and of our exile from the place where Alleluias abound. Our Alleluia is sung no more until such a time we have duly contemplated the depth of our need for God's life-giving forgiveness until we celebrate the joy of our resurrection hope. So let these 40 days and Sundays until Eastertide be our time to look upon our own need for God's healing and upon the cross, God's means of salvation and hope eternal. We sing our Alleluia and we bid its joyous air goodbye for now. And please join me as we turn to hymn number 318. We'll sing the first and the last verses. Alleluia, sing of gladness, voice of joy that cannot die. Alleluia is the anthem ever dear to choirs on high. In the house of God abiding, thus they sing eternally. In our hymns we pray with longing, grant us blessed Trinity. At the last, to keep glad Easter with the faithful saints on high, there to you forever singing, Alleluia, joy. Some dry 